Hey, deserve listeners, Darcy and Stacy, season four. Let's watch. Number one, there's a lot of photos with filters. How would you feel if I showed you a True. picture of a guy and he looks all young and then when you see him, he's got... Right. Okay. So I kind of need you to give me some photos that are okay. more... Yeah, this is great that the matchmaker is really going for this in this moment. I mean, there's a chance that this could actually be really hard for Darcy to do, to publicly put out there a, a more realistic photograph of herself, could really challenge a lot of the foundation upon which she stands to somehow eke out a little bit of self-worth in this world. So this, this could be a big ask for her, but I, I'm glad they're talking about it for sure authentic to who you look, okay? I sent her some great photos. Yes, they had some filters on it. I mean, it's still me. You know, I didn't really... It's not you. When you have a filter, it's not you. <laughs> it's still me? No, it's not. It's not you. It's a... I think that's one of the things that has happened over the past 50 years of my life is this, this creeping normalcy into a world in which filters and optimizing photographs is the real you. Like that real picture of me, that's not the real me. This filtered picture is the real me. This blending, this confusion with what you can manufacture in a fake manner on your phone or on a computer is the real you. And the real you is not the real you. The real you is some weird thing, some canvas upon which filters can be applied. That's the real you. And you know, we could, talk about all the ins and outs of that, but I think just hearing her say that, it's still me, and it's like, you're the canvas upon which a computer is putting something on top of. I mean, you understand what a filter is. It doesn't just highlight or touch, you know, it doesn't just like smooth things over. It's applying something, a, a fake mask on top of you. It's not you. No, she was looking for at the time, so I just kind of sent her the best ones that I had in my phone at the time. But I'm totally fine taking more pictures with, you know, all natural. Tell me about your family, like your upbringing. Okay. Um, I'm a twin. And, okay. um, you know, we had... Uh... Yeah, this is nice. I don't know how this is going to go, but this is evidence that the matchmaker's success or worth as a professional might have much more to do with this exploration aspect of the relationship and not necessarily the ability or the supposed ability that she may or may not have to be able to match people up and determine that they're going to work out as a couple. So let's watch this. Um, an older brother, so it was just the three of us with my mom and dad. Okay. Um, they got divorced around when I was 12. Um, my dad's a businessman. Okay, I don't think we knew that. I'm always looking for information, just any detail, so I don't think we knew when the parents got divorced, so age 12, it's interesting. We was always kind of looked up to him, like, wow, he's got such an exciting life, but mm -hmm. he was busy a lot, he, was, he was, wasn't home a lot. Well, I think that revelation to us, or to me, could explain a lot. I don't know, but I've taken guesses along these lines without knowing anything to support this, but we just heard it. So we hear, here's some very important details from her that one, dad worked a lot and was gone, and we looked up to him. We, I don't know if this is what she's saying, but it sounds like what she's saying is, and, you know, seeing their vibe with their mom. So let me just throw something out there in terms of what it could feel like for Darcy and Stacy when they were young, uh, pre- and post-divorce between their parents. Uh, my impression from what they've said is that they were shy and nerdy and quiet and rejected, I think they might have moved around a lot too, which can really exacerbate that feeling and cause that feeling in kids and highlight it. But at the very uh, least, we know that they talk about their years as kids as not being cool, not having friends, not being popular, no one wanting to date them, feeling awkward. They, I think, even said, yeah, we were the weird twins. And so we could see, and this is just me making up a story, so I don't know, but I could see a scenario where Darcy and Stacy are home, the older brother's still around, so he's a part of the family, but if we focus on the mom anyway, the dad's gone, and Darcy and Stacy are like feeling bad, they're having peer pressure, they have self-esteem issues, 
they're feeling rejected from dad because dad, so that's just one of the things that could happen. Even if the dad was very loving and attentive when he could be, children will interpret the lack of your, you being there as evidence that they don't matter and that they're not good enough. This can even happen to parents that go into hospital for uh, medical reasons. You can have a, a parent who has a major medical issue that they have to go to the the hospital, maybe even travel for six months to get treatment or whatnot. And even though the kids know, absolutely, my dad is just in the hospital for six months because he has a medical issue, it can start to feel like deep down to the child that if they were only better, dad would pay attention to them more. If they mattered more, if dad loved them more, they would actually pay more attention to me. Again, intellectually, they're like, that doesn't make any sense. But the the heart doesn't necessarily think rationally. So we can imagine that Darcy and Stacy, if we just fo- focus on Darcy, that she's feeling that rejection from the dad and it hurts her feelings. And then she's stuck at home with mom, who, and mom definitely comes across as more awkward than the dad. Uh, it's hard to know what she's really like, but the mom comes across, at least the way they treat her, it's almost like they treat her like almost like she's a child in a lot of ways, like she doesn't know what's going on. or uh, So I could imagine that because the system treated the mom that way or the mom saw herself that way or the mom has some issue that lends itself in that direction, I don't know, that Darcy and Stacy would feel like we are losers. We don't, we don't matter because dad doesn't love us. Our peers don't like us. We're ugly ducklings. I think it's the way they saw themselves. And we're stuck at home with our weird mom, with our weird parent, our ineffectual failure of a mom. I don't know if that's how they saw her, but I think there's some evidence that at least they saw her that way, the mom. And if only we were cool like our dad who has money and travels and is interesting and has, you know, can buy things and he's in another country, you know, which might lend them to want to date people from other countries, Darcy and Stacy sort of locks that in of just like, well, that's interesting to think about. Have I made this connection before? That they could, as a way, as a sort of a veiled way of trying to get their dad back, they're actually trying to pull men from other countries back home. Sound familiar? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I mean, it doesn't ruin their life to have a sort of a weird veiled preference like that. It limits things, right? But, you know, it doesn't mean they're set up for failure. Um, You know, that's one of those things about our personality as a defense that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to ruin things for us, right? It just kind of limits options and, I don't know, whatever gets the motor running in terms of attraction, I suppose. But So there's that. So that really locks in this notion that you need to have a lot of money, you need to have a lot of prestige, you don't really ultimately matter. People only matter when they have money and they can travel everywhere and they do fancy things. Because my impression was that the dad actually did some fancy things from what I understand. So, huh, that's interesting. So it it aligns with all my hypotheses about Darcy that uh, the foundation of all this is that she believes she is worthless and unattractive and unlovable. And all the weirdness that you see is based on that. And the way it specifically plays out was influenced by her early experiences. You know, the the template of the the foreign man or the template of the man who, because, you know, you could also imagine the dad would come back and would shower. So, yeah, that's interesting, too, uh, with gifts and with, because it would be uncommon for a dad in a situation like that to try to buy his way out of the shame of neglecting his kids. And so he comes back and he takes them out to dinner. And and you can imagine a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old Darcy uh, looking for any excuse to believe that she's worthy of love from dad or that dad loves her. And uh, and then to have siblings, particularly a, a twin sister, to compare and be like, is she getting more than I'm getting? Am I getting more? She's getting, you know, kids will do that when, the, when they don't get enough love and attention. They'll start to really compare how much are they getting, how much am I getting in terms of material goods. And so there, that sets that dynamic up. And then it locks in this notion of like, love equals travel from afar and shower me with gifts. That's interesting. And you will leave me eventually because I'm not worthy. It's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> is it not? 
I, mean, I don't know. It's just spe total speculation, of course. Dad um, got married two other times um, and then divorced those two other times. So, um, oh, my parents got divorced when we were 12. And I don't really feel like I had a good example to see and know what a healthy relationship looks like. Yeah, uh, that's another factor. Something that we don't think about is, the, like, for me, my parents have, are still together. They're coming up on their 60th anniversary. And there were a lot of really positive things that my, you know, there were negative things, of course, but there were a lot of really positive things that they modeled for me that I just absorbed and then recreated or sought to create in my relationship with Stacy. So, yeah, that's, that's another factor for sure. It's like, they don't know, or what was modeled to them, what was shown to them was, well, that's another part of it potentially too. You know, we don't know who broke up with who, but we can imagine that the dad left the mom. I don't know why I'm saying it that way, but it just kind of, a lot of the things that were said, it just has that vibe. So that would be another thing is the kids, the twins might really identify with the mom and feel like, well, if mom's not worthy of him, then maybe we're not worthy of him. And it's another reason to believe that we're not worthy unless we drastically change ourselves in the way that we look. My mom, she never got remarried. Especially if the dad actually, and who knows, this is complete speculation, there's no data. If the dad, because the dad remarried twice, and so you can imagine young Darcy and Stacy saying, well, what's so special about those other? Because these other women, in all likelihood, meant that the dad even had less time for them. Who knows? But it's possible. And what if the other women were sort of the way that Darcy and Stacy try to look? You know what I mean? And so they're they're always trying to not look like their mom and look like these other women. I don't know. It's just <laughs> I've been watching this show for so long. I'm just always trying to figure out how did we get here. She never really dated much after the divorce. My dad, even though he's had multiple marriages, they were not long lasting. And I guess the other model that was modeled to them was that the dad looks like he might have dated people younger than him, which is another lesson that they might have internalized. And so if we use this as a jumping off point, all these things that I'm saying, think about for yourself. What was the model to you? What were you taught in terms of what a relationship should look like? What were you, what messages were you given that you might not exactly intuit about you and your worth and how lovable you are and how worth love you are and how worth of attention you are? Because when we are given those messages, we believe them to be true, even when we fight against them sometimes, but particularly if we are not fighting against them, then we're really just lost in the woods. And to challenge those, to work on them and to heal from them. I'm sure it affected, you know, both Stacy and I. And now I just feel like I don't want to be like my mom. Lonely. Yeah, I think she said something like this before. And of course, there's nothing irrational or unhealthy about looking at your mom and seeing loneliness, seeing suffering and saying, I don't want to be like that. But you could also imagine this would add to the problems, the distortions and the desperation and potentially the creating a false self because we often feel like our parents, particularly if the mom was the main parent that paid attention, it's like, well, I, we can't be us. If, I, if, I, if I'm just natural and if I'm just myself, the way my mom was herself, then I will be lonely and depressed and sad just like her, which would not be the lesson I would hope that Darcy would have learned from that, right? And of course, I'm sure I've said this before with Darcy, that when we are treated that way, we have a tendency to recreate those relationships through projective identification or the repetition compulsion or other schemas that, that bite us in the butt or shoot us in the butt, or shoot us in the foot, <laughs> bite us in the ass. And so we end up subconsciously recreating situations that we actually are running away from for a variety of reasons. One, there, it, so for example, Darcy, because she was continually being rejected, felt rejected by dad, then she might be subconsciously recreating that again by the sort of people that she dates or even by making sure that they will reject her by prodding them and micromanage them and, and 
and criticizing them. By doing that, you recreate it because it feels comfortable, because that's what you grew up with. You're also potentially trying to rework the past subconsciously. You're hoping this time it'll be different, that kind of thing. There's a lot of reasons why we repeat past relationships in a defensive, subconscious way. I do. Sometimes we, I think we just choose the wrong ones because we don't have the lonely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great beginning. That would not be what I would hope that she would land on because that's an important thing to realize. But unless she has a, a robust self-awareness in addition to that, then you can't really, what do you do with that bit of self-awareness? It's like, oh, I'm, I'm only choosing people because I'm desperate. If, if that's all you have to go on, then that's not enough to fix the problem because you still need people. You still need companionship. So I guess I'll just head into the void and hope I find someone. Head into the breach, I guess is a better term. But for her, I would hope she would say, okay, well, what else is going on with me that is creating the problem other than the fact that I might be acting out of desperation? So just got to figure it out. That's why I feel like I need to talk to Michelle and try to figure things out for myself so I don't, you know, die alone. Yeah, uh, that's normal. That A lot of people worry about that. There's nothing different about Darcy in that way. She longs for companionship, and that is normal. So she's exhibiting that. She's exhibiting real vulnerability here. But I'm worried that, once again, it's just in this narrow understanding of, I have picked the wrong guys to date in the past. Maybe because of my desperation, because I don't want to be like my mom. I don't want to be lonely like my parents. So I'm desperately choosing the people, and that results in me choosing the wrong people. But that's not the lesson that I've taken away from watching this show. It's not a matter of her choosing. In fact, Georgie, at least from what we saw, it's hard to know what was happening behind the scenes, Georgie was one of the best people for her. He was very accommodating. He would always apologize first and often, even when he didn't need to apologize. He let things go. He would be vulnerable. He, he was, uh, you know, he fit all the, he checked all the boxes that she's looking for, you know, the sort of where he's from and how he looks and all that kind of stuff. All that was there. And and again, from what we saw on the TV show, they had a potential of working out if she hadn't sabotaged the whole situation, seemingly. I can't tell, but that's the way it looked on, on the TV show. So it's not a matter of picking the wrong people. It's a matter of what she does subconsciously, you know, meaning that she's not aware of her distortions and her behavior as a result of her distortion, she's, she seemingly is completely unaware of the very normal process that everyone does, that we will distort things, particularly when there's a lot at stake in a companionship, and then we will operate from those distortions. We will feel emotions that don't make any sense, and we will act on those emotions, and our behavior won't make any sense. Uh, she seems to be completely unaware of that universal fact. All right, well, that is it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.